Hello and welcome to the section uh, 10.1 lecture video. So I'm trying out a new method for this. So I thought I'd uh, go ahead and add my little face to the beginning uh, just so uh, add a little personal touch to the videos. So uh, go ahead and open your new notes, which you can download from the handout section on my math lab. And we'll start chapter 10. So in this chapter, uh, what we're going to be talking about is how to test a hypothesis using statistics. So this is the idea of how to use the probability uh, and statistical methods we've learned about so far in this class to test a hypothesis. So to start out with, let's just look at an example um, from life, something with a fairly easy probability for us to calculate. So a friend of yours wants to play a simple game in which a coin is flipped. If the coin comes up heads, you win. If it comes up tails, your friend wins. Suppose that the outcome of five plays of the game is tails, 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 tails. Is your friend cheating you? So in order to decide whether or not your friend is cheating you, we can use the statistical methods we're going to learn about in this uh, chapter. So the first thing you want to do is you need to write your hypotheses. Okay, so we're going to talk about two different types of hypotheses. Okay, we're going to have a null hypothesis which is basically the idea that whatever we think is happening isn't happening. So in this case, that would be our friend is not cheating. Okay, and then we're going to have an alternative hypothesis. And our alternative hypothesis here is our friend is cheating. And so the idea is to use statistics uh, to find out the probability of whatever is occurring, occurring. So in this case, um, what we want to do is we want to set a boundary for um, what level of probability we would, ex we would uh, like to show that our friend is cheating. So, and we set this level based on the seriousness of... Um, of throwing out the null hypothesis. So we call this the level of significance. Uh, and we use the Greek letter alpha to stand for it. And the most standard practice is to call this 5%, the, the number we've been using for unusual so far in this class. So the idea is if our probability is less than alpha, then we're going to throw out the null hypothesis and we're going to go with the alternative hypothesis. And so we set this level lower if it's a more significant. So like if this is just kind of an acquaintance or a Facebook friend or something like that, so it's not um, that big a deal if we you know make them mad and they aren't our friend anymore, we might leave this level where it is or maybe even set it higher, like 10%. But if this is like a really close friend, a friend, someone who's been a friend our entire life, something like that, uh, someone we'd hate to lose our friendship with, then we probably want to set this even lower, like 1% or 0.5%. So that's the idea. So now what we have to do is we have to do calculate the probability of five tails in a row. Okay, so we go back to what we learned in Chapter 5. And so... Um, to find the probability of five tails in a row, we take the probability of a tails to the fifth power. So that's one, one over 32, which is zero point zero three one two five. So now in this case, that is less than alpha. So what we would do is we would reject the null hypothesis. And we would say there is sufficient evidence to suggest the alternative hypothesis, which in this case is our friend is cheating. Okay, And so that's the idea of what we're going to be doing here and what we're going to be talking about uh, in more details when it comes to hypothesis testing.
Okay, so let's go ahead and start diving into what some of these terms mean and looking at them more specifically. So a hypothesis is a statement regarding a characteristic of one or more populations. Hypothesis testing is a procedure based on sample evidence and probability used to test statements regarding a characteristic of one or more populations. So the steps in hypothesis testing are you state the, uh, make a statement about the nature of the population, you collect sample data to test the statement, and then the data are analyzed using uh, to assess the plausibility of the statement. Like we said before, we're gonna start out with two hypotheses. So the first one is the null hypothesis, denoted H sub zero, which we read as H naught, is a statement to be tested. The null hypothesis is a statement of no change, no effect, or no difference. So it's what we thought was true, what is the current thinking. Then we have the alternative hypothesis. And our alternative hypothesis is that, which we call H1, is a statement that we are trying to find evidence to support. In this chapter, it will be a statement regarding the value of the population parameter. So in the example we just used, the null hypothesis was the idea that our friend wasn't cheating, right? That's the standard thinking, is that you're not being cheated. And then the alternative hypothesis was that we were. Now, when we go to do these statistical tests, there are basically three options um, for doing these. Either Equal hypothesis versus not equal. So this is called two-tailed because it goes in both directions. And it's either the parameter is equal to some value or it's not equal to some value. This is the idea um, of just change. Okay. So the idea that a value has changed. We don't really care in which direction, but just that it's different than it used to be. The second ob ob option is equal versus less than. So this is called left-tailed, right? Because less than is to the left. And this is the idea that if the parameter either equals some value or it's less than some value. So this is the idea that the value has decreased. And then the third option is right-tailed. In this case, we're doing equal versus greater than. We're saying the parameter equal, equals some value or it's greater than some value. And this is the idea that it's increased in value. Left-tailed and right-tailed tests are referred to as one-tailed. Okay, And so those are the three options. Either we're saying that the value has changed, the value has decreased, or the value has increased. So we could try writing some hypotheses um, for some given situation. So in 2007, the standard deviation SAT score on the reasoning test for all students taking the exam was 113. A teacher believes that due to changes to the high school curricula, the standard deviation SAT math score has decreased. Okay, so to write these, every time we start out by writing the null hypothesis, and the null hypothesis is always going to be whatever the parameter is equals the value we started with. So in this case, the standard deviation is, we're talking about standard deviation, so that's sigma equals 113. Okay. Then for H1, we're also going to write the standard deviation in 113, and then it's just a matter of did it, are we saying it changed, it decreased, or it increased? In this case, we're saying it decreased, so that means we're going to put sigma is less than 113. Okay. And that's how all of these are going to work. So you just need to figure out which um, parameter you're talking about. So you're talking about mu, sigma, or p, and then are you talking about increased, decreased, or changed. So according to the CTA, IA, the Wireless Association, the mean monthly cell phone bill was $494 in 2007. A researcher suspects that the mean monthly cell phone bill is different today. So first of all, we're dealing with mean, which is a typo here, so that should say mean. Here it's spelled right. So when we write h naught, we're going to use mu, right? Because mu is the mean. And so that equaled $49.94. And so then H1, we're going to use mu 
and 49.94. And then we just need to decide, are we talking about increase, decrease, or changed? And so since it says different today, that does not give us direction, so that's just going to be changed. So we're going to write not equal to. Okay, so the researcher in this case does not care whether it's gone up or down, just whether or not it's different than it used to be. Okay, so if you wanted to, at this point, you could pause the video and try writing the other hypotheses for these last three. Okay, so now that we've tried these, let's go ahead and go through them together. So federal law requires that a jar of peanut butter that is labeled as containing 32 ounces must contain at least 32 ounces. A consumer advocate feels that a certain peanut butter manufacturer is short, shorting customers by underfilling jars. So in this case, we're talking, um, we've got H0 and H1. Um, in this case, we're talking about quantity. So this one's a little harder to discern what's going on here because they don't use the word mean or standard deviation or um, proportion, but we're talking about quantity. So that means we're going to talk about mean. So this is going to be mu equals 32, right? Because the null hypothesis is always mu equals the value. And then in this case, the consumer advocate thinks they're being shorting or underfilling the jars. So that would be the alternative hypothesis is that we're less than 32. This is also a good point here because where it says up here, it says federal requir law requires that a jar of peanut butter that is labeled as containing 32 ounces must contain at least 32 ounces. Anytime you're dealing with um, greater than or equal to or less than or equal to, that's going to be your equal statement. So even though what the federal law says is that mu has to be greater than or equal to 32, what we do is for the null hypothesis, we just assume that it is that, and then for the alternative, we look for the opposite of this. And the opposite of greater than or equal to is less than. Okay, so that's the idea. The third one says, according to giving and volunteering in the United States, the 2001 edition, the mean shareable contribution per household in the United States in 2000 was $1,623. A researcher believes that the level of giving has changed since then. So notice here we're dealing with the mean. So this will be age not of mu equals 1623. And so our alternative hypothesis is going to be mu and 1623. And then it says that it's changed. So that's going to be not equal to. And then the last one says, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 10.2% of registered births in the United States in 2005 were to teenage mothers. A sociologist believes this percentage has increased since then. So notice here we're given a percentage, and we're not using the word mean or anything like that, so that means we're going to be doing the proportion. So this is the first example with that. So we're going to write that P equals 0 0.102, so we write that as a decimal. And then H1 is going to be P... The, research, the sociologist thinks it's increased, so that would be P is greater than 0 0.102. Okay, so whenever we're doing a hypothesis test, this is the first thing we need to be able to do, is write the hypothesis. Once you've written the hypotheses, um, then we can start trying to find a result. And there are four outcomes when you do a hypothesis test. Either we reject the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true. So if the alternative hypothesis is true, then we do want to reject it. If our um, friend is cheating us, then we do want to reject the fact that they're not cheating us. So that would be a correct decision. The second option would be that we do not reject the null hypothesis. This happens when the null hypothesis is true. If our friend isn't cheating us, we don't want to reject the null hypothesis that they aren't cheating us. We want to keep that. So that would also be a correct decision. So there are two ways to be correct. You can reject the null hypothesis when the alternative is true, or you could not reject the null hypothesis when it is true. Those would be correct decisions. There's also two incorrect decisions. So we reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true, this decision would be incorrect. So if our friend isn't cheating us and we t say that they are cheating us, that would be an incorrect decision. This is called a type 1 error. And we write 1 in Roman numerals here. 
The other option is we do not reject the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true. So our friend is cheating us, but we think they aren't cheating us. This decision would be incorrect. This type of error is type 2 error. So if we, and then here this is all in a chart. So these four options written out in a chart. So of the two types of error we could have, looking at the example we're talking about with our friend and whether or not they're cheating us, the question is, well, which one's probably a bigger deal? So would it be bigger to call our friend a cheater when they're not? Or would it be better to assume they're not a cheater when they actually are? Well, one of those is going to end your friendship, and one of the other ones you're just going to be a kind of a dupe, uh, duped by them, but you're still going to have your friend. So I think most of us would say that the type 1 error is probably the bigger deal, calling someone a cheater when they're actually not. So alpha, this value we've already talked about, the level of significance, is the probability of getting a type 1 error. And then we also have a Greek letter beta, which is the probability of a type 2 error. You cannot control for both of these, so we normally choose to control alpha because that's usually the more serious one, to reject the status quo when the status quo is in fact true. This is called the level of significance. And this is how we're going to choose alpha. So we're going to choose our level of significance based on how important is it to not make a type 1 error. So the more important it is to not make a type 1 error, the lower alpha will get. Okay. So that's the idea of what can happen. Now, what we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to write conclusions based on um, our results from our statistical analysis. So in sections 10.2 and 10.3, we're going to talk about how to do these hypo do that statistical analysis for the um, hypothesis test. But for now, we want to talk about, well, what do we write after we've done that? So there's two things that happen when you do a statistical analysis. If your probability value is not less than alpha, or if it is less than alpha, you either do not reject or reject the null hypothesis, and then you write a conclusion about the alternative hypothesis. So let's look at some examples. So in 2007, the standard deviation SAT score on the reasoning test for all students uh, taking the exam was 113. A teacher believes that due to changes to the high school curricula, the standard deviation SAT math scores has decreased. The null hypothesis is rejected. So we already wrote these hypotheses, but I'll go ahead and write them again. We said H0 was sigma equals 113, and H1 is sigma is less than 113 because we think it has decreased. And so the null hypothesis gets rejected. So if we reject them, so that's the first thing we would normally state if we had done this analysis ourselves. We'd state the null hypothesis has been rejected or it has not been rejected. So since we said the null hypothesis has been rejected, that means we're going to go with this one. Now, all these results are probabilities. So we cannot, we don't want to say we've proved something. What we want to say is that we have sufficient evidence. So one way to write this would be there is sufficient evidence to suggest, and then we write the alternative hypothesis, that the standard deviation of SAT math scores has decreased. Okay, so if we reject the null hypothesis, then we say there is sufficient evidence to suggest the alternative hypothesis, and we write out what that alternative hypothesis was in English. Okay, now, if we do not reject the null hypothesis, like in the second example, then we're going to say there is not sufficient evidence to suggest the alternative hypothesis. So according to the CTIA, the Wireless Association, the mean monthly cell phone bill was $49.94 in 2007. A researcher suspects that the mean monthly cell phone bill is different today. So once again, we already wrote these earlier in the section, but let's go ahead and write them again. So in this case, we're talking about means. So mu equals 49.94. H1 would be mu 
um, does not because he thinks they're different today. So does not equal 49.94. And so then if we do not reject the null hypothesis, then we write there is not sufficient evidence to suggest the alternative hypothesis. And in this case, the alternative hypothesis is that the mean monthly cell phone bill is either different than it was in 2007 or that the mean monthly cell phone bill does not equal $49.94. So if you reject the null hypothesis, then you say there is sufficient evidence for the alternative hypothesis. And if you do not reject the null hypothesis, then you say there is not sufficient evidence for the alternative hypothesis. Okay, and notice how we're leaving a little bit of wiggle room in there because we're doing everything with probabilities here, so nothing is a certainty, but we're just saying that there's a lot of evidence to support this. So go ahead and take a couple minutes, pause the video, and try these other three. Once again, we already wrote the hypotheses for these, so if you get stuck on one of those, you can flip back a couple pages or back up in the video to see what those were. Okay, so now that you've had a chance to try these on your own, I'm just going to go ahead and first copy down the hypotheses that we already did from earlier. Okay, and so now... This first one says the null hypothesis is not rejected, so we would write there is not sufficient evidence to suggest the alternative hypothesis. So to suggest that the manufacturer is under filling jars. Okay, the second one says the null, we're rejecting the null hypothesis, so therefore we want to say there is sufficient evidence for the alternative. So there is sufficient evidence to suggest that the mean charitable contribution is different today than in 2001. Okay, something like that. So there is sufficient evidence to suggest the alternative hypothesis. And then the last one, we are once again rejecting the null hypothesis. So there is sufficient evidence to suggest the proportion of births to teenage mothers has increased since 2005. Okay, something like that. Okay, so that's how you write a conclusion. Then the last thing here is about the type 1 and type 2 errors um, that we've talked about previously and putting all this stuff together. So let's just try a couple more of these, uh, and then we'll be done for this section. So according to popcorn.org, the mean consumption of popcorn annually by Americans is 54 quarts. The marketing division of popcorn.org unleashes an aggressive campaign designed to get Americans to consume more popcorn. Determine the null and alternative hypotheses that could be used to test the effectiveness of the marketing campaign. So here we should notice the word mean and that they want to get them to consume even more popcorn. So that means H0 is what is currently happening, the status quo, so the mu equals 54. 
And then H1 would be we want to increase it. So mu is greater than 54. So a sample of 800 Americans provides enough evidence to conclude that the marketing campaign was effective. Provide a statement that should be put out by the marketing department. So if there is enough evidence to um, conclude the marketing campaign was effective, we would first would reject H0, and then we could say there is sufficient evidence to suggest... Americans are now eating more than 54 quarts of popcorn a year. Okay, so we rejected H0 so we can say there is sufficient evidence of the alternative hypothesis. And then it asks, suppose, in fact, the mean annual consumption of popcorn after the marketing campaign is 53.4 quarts. So that means it hasn't gone up. Has a type 1 or type 2 error been made by the marketing department? If they tested the hypothesis at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance, what is the probability of making a type 1 error? So the key here is we rejected H0 when H0 was true. So if you look back at the chart, we reject H0 when H0 is true. So that's a type 1 error. And alpha is the probability of making that error. So the probability of a type 1 error in this case was alpha, which is 0 0.05. So there was a 5% chance that that would happen. Okay, so that's the idea. So at this point, go ahead and pause the video for a second and try doing the second one. Okay, so now that you've tried the second one, let's go through it together. So according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, in 2005, 15.2% of 10th grade students had tried marijuana. The Drug Abuse and Resistance Education, DARE program, underwent several major, major changes to keep up with technology and issues facing students in the 21st century. After the changes, the school resource officer, SRO, thinks the proportion of 10th grade students who have tried marijuana has decreased from the 2005 level, levels. Write the null hypothesis. Okay, so notice here that he thinks the proportion has decreased. So that means our H0 is what it currently was or what it was in 2005. So that's 0.152 written as a decimal. And then he thinks it's decreased, so that would be P is less than 0.152. So if the sample data suggests the null hypothesis should not be rejected, then what conclusion can we wait? Well, then we can conclude there is not sufficient evidence of um, to support the alternative hypo hypothesis. So there's not sufficient evidence to suggest that the proportion of 10th graders that have tried marijuana has decreased from 2005. Okay, so there is not sufficient evidence. If we do not reject the null hypothesis, then we say there is not sufficient evidence to suggest the alternative hypothesis. And then suppose that, in fact, the proportion of 10th grade students who have tried marijuana is 14.7%. Was a type 1 or a type 2 error committed? Well, 14.7 is less than 15.2, so P is less than 0.152. So that means we did not reject... H0 when H1 was true. So if we look back at our chart, we did not reject H0 when H1 was true, so that's a type 2 error. Okay. And so that's it for section 10.1. Um, moving on from here, uh, in sections 10.2 and 10.3, we're going to talk about how to actually do the calculations to do these hypothesis tests. Um, we're going to talk about two methods briefly, but we're going to focus on this p-value approach because it's the most commonly used method today. 
Don't forget to do your homework assignments for this week. And if you have any questions, feel free to call, text, or email me. And you can always uh, come to my virtual office hours as well.